Welcome to Beyond Places, the podcast about the planning, design, and leadership of the communities and cities we call home. I'm Carmi Palafox, an urban planner and economist. Join me in conversations with thought leaders and visionaries from around the world. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Beyond Places. Our guest is a crime prevention and community safety specialist focusing on the planning, design, management, and maintenance of the safe city. His key area of interest is the relationship between crime and architecture and how human behavior interacts with the built form in towns and cities. He is an expert in the application of SEPTED principles, that is crime prevention through environmental design, and has extensively studied how behaviors relate to the way we plan and design public and private spaces. He provides crime prevention advice on a range of projects, including the Sydney Metro, and is working with several local governments on CBD master plans and improving problematic public spaces. He is currently offering SEPTED courses to government and the private sector through local government New South Wales and hopes to publish his book, Preventing Crime in Towns and Cities, an illustrated septed guide to safe, livable, and sustainable urban solutions next year. He has authored numerous crime prevention and community safety plans and strategies, including Sydney's Safe City Strategy and the Parramatta City Council Crime Prevention Plan. Welcome, John Maynard. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, John. Thanks for making time for us today. To start off, can you describe your work as community safety and a crime prevention specialist? Quite a a sort of complex area in a way. It's sort of a a combination between sort of the social environment and the way that humans behave, try to understand their motivations for that behaviour and how that behaviour interacts then with the environment that they're in. So all of us are influenced to some extent by the the setting or the situation that we find ourselves in, and that in turn can influence our behaviour. So my work is really about looking at those two elements, the social and the physical, and looking at the unique characteristics of specific locations and how those things combine to make for safer or not so safe spaces and places. What influenced you to pursue this career path? Inadvertently, really, is something I fell into. My background's in psychology and working with people with disabilities. So I was working in counselling. Then I was working in, got my first job in local government, working with young people. A background in social disadvantage, I suppose, or people who are marginalised to some extent. Um, then in the sort of late 1990s, local government in Australia began to take more of an active role in community safety and crime prevention. So people would, you know, raise their concerns with local councillors, elected representatives about their safety concerns in public places. And essentially, that's what local government does, uh, amongst many other um, responsibilities, is plan and manage and maintain public spaces. So there was this sort of movement toward local government taking on a greater role in sort of that space beyond their already sort of indirect role in terms of providing street lighting and and emptying people's rubbish and waste, removing graffiti from the wall, those kind of things, that they wanted an an actual specialist position to come in and actually work out these two elements of the, the social and the physical and look at the role that local government could play with the state and and various other partners and stakeholders in working toward building safer communities. How would you describe SEPTED? So SEPTED, it's a bit of a mouthful, crime prevention through environmental design. And like anything else, it's open to lots of different interpretations. But for me, it's really about the blend of the social and the physical environment, understanding those factors that are happening in time, in space, at a specific site, recognising those unique characteristics, observing human behaviour, looking at crime data and types of um, evidence, talking to people using that space. Then once you understand that context, then looking to um, put some sort of intervention in place. 
which is informed by SEPCA. So it is this sort of balance between the social and the physical environment from a planning and design um, sort of lens, if you like, and uh, not only looking to reduce crime and reduce fear of crime, but also looking to improve broader livability and quality of life. So with what you said, John, of course, it's the interplay between social and uh, physical factors that come into play in, in a location. But you mentioned there are principles, accepted principles. So these are always considered in different locations that you do work in. What are the accepted principles? Okay, so if, if you go into a location that could be seen to have be problematic in terms of people feeling fearful or where there may have been some sort of incident, you go into that, that site in person and you look at the four septet principles. Firstly, you look at the notion of surveillance, that this idea that we want to see and be seen. So when we go to public places, we're attracted to those places essentially by other people. If we just went to places where there wasn't anybody, um, it wouldn't feel right. You know, there wouldn't be that vibe or that energy or that vitality that attracts us to public spaces. So we would look at this notion of surveillance, who's using the space, who's observing one another in that space, or why isn't that happening for whatever reason. We would look at access control and movement. So we're not necessarily with SEPTED looking at, at public spaces, we're also looking at private spaces. So access control is very much about ensuring that only legitimate people get into and out of places. People with the wrong intentions will try to get into places they shouldn't be, for example. So you need some sort of access control in place, whether that's a fence, or a person, or a code, key card entry, a turnstile, whatever it is, to control who gets in and out. And also this notion of movement, that if we need to have this pedestrian flow and in, in environments where we get constrained or constricted, uh, where we bump into one another, that's a potential for conflict as well. So surveillance, access, control and movement. We also look at the principle of what's known as territorial reinforcement, which really refers to ownership or activity. So where a place doesn't appear to be cared for, where it's not clear what the intended use of that space is, then those spaces are often commandeered by people with criminal intentions. So we often have to go back to thinking, well, why did we design this space in this way in the first place? What was its intended use? And if necessary, we can put ownership cues in place to make, you know, whether that's um, landscaping or some sort of change to the physical environment, like extra lighting, um, just so that the place is cared for. And you may also introduce an activity into what might be called a dead space where there's nothing going on, but you still want to attract people in that area or there are people moving in and around that area. So to integrate a dead space into, into the broader public realm where there are more people, you might then look to add an activity into that place as well. So you've got this sense that the space is owned and cared for and the activity then brings those other notions into place of surveillance that we're attracted to being seen and seen uh, and the vitality of other people. And lastly, you've probably heard of the broken window theory and this notion of uh, environmental management and maintenance where we have a cycle of urban decay in a public place, which might be graffiti or rubbish dumping or indeed a broken window, it may lead to a further uh, deterioration in that space. That can then lead to higher perceptions of fear, so people can be fearful when they see environments that are poorly managed or maintained. And they also, they can, that can lead to avoidance behaviour, which so, so people stop going to places, which again negates that surveillance effect of being attracted to seeing and being seen and, other, and the vitality that other people provide. So there is an integration between those four principles. So where a space is working well, it's often the four principles working together. You have worked on a variety of um, locations and settings, including, for example, parks and, and public open spaces, more uh, quiet residential streets, uh, as well as very busy streets and a range of development types. Do certain principles become more important in a, a more active public space compared to other spaces? Yeah, I, I think that the notion of surveillance is, is really important in, in public spaces. So, you know, whether we're doing that with people, where we're actually trying to bring people into a space, or you can obviously do it with technology, with post-circuit television or 
or other physical improvements like lighting can attract people into the space. But ultimately, it all comes back to the unique characteristics of the site. So, for example, last week I was up in Newcastle doing a, a set-ted report on a park upgrade. Um, and when I went to that park at night, I noted all the lighting was very subdued. It was very, really quite dim. But the park had a lot of networks of paths. It was a really good walking and cycling environment. But it was, wasn't very well lit at night. Now... I go in there and I don't know if, because the lighting's subdued, this might be a deliberate strategy, for example. The council might be saying, well, we need to save on energy costs and we want to actually, our intention is to discourage use of the park at night. So therefore we'll have dim, subdued lighting so that we'll encourage pedestrians and cyclists to walk around the perimeter of the park rather than using the park uh, after dark. Right? Now, I don't know, as, a, as an objective person going into that site, whether that is the intention of the, of the council or whether that's just evolved that way over time and that just happens to be the lighting that was put in place you know, back in the day. And if I was asked to just talk to the current person in that role, they might not know what the intended use of that space is at night. So this is all part of looking at that broader picture of, okay, so they're gonna do a playground upgrade there, they're gonna put new public toilets and amenities in there and, both those sort of settings have their own um, community safety or crime prevention issues. So then I'm sort of coming in and saying, well, you've, you've also got a lighting strategy to go with, with those um, upgrades. Is the intention now shifting toward encouraging nighttime use? Because that, in some respects, is a good thing because it will bring people into the playground after dark, which is a good thing usually in the winter, for example, when the days are short and you have less daylight. Uh, but of course, if you have lights that are on well into the night and early morning, that can present another set of problems like, um, you know, vandalism, people hanging out in the park with the wrong intentions and so forth. So it really is about the unique characteristics of the site and understanding what the intended use of the space is. So in understanding the unique characteristics of a site, I imagine there's a lot of um, consultations and in, in observations that you do with the local community and yeah yeah, yeah. that's really something that you can never underestimate people who are familiar with the space it's very easy just as a bureaucrat to sit in an office and a landscape architect will present you with the plan for the new park upgrade and say so, okay john well, what, what's your set ted recommendations based on these series of diagrams and pictures right so i've got a background in psychology and, uh, and a, a master's degree in public health, I don't have any training in reading maps and plans and diagrams and figures and so forth. And when you're in a room full of planners and architects and builders and urban designers, and it's quite intimidating for someone who's got a background more on the social side of things. Um, and this is where it's really important to establish context because I can't look at a map and go, oh, there's a, there's a green circle that says a tree is going to put into it. Instead of saying in the beginning when I was lacking in confidence and wasn't sure how to apply my expertise, I found it quite confronting and challenging. But then I realised it was up to me to get the people who draw these figures and maps and plans to explain them to me. And the way that they can do that is by me as a septet practitioner asking the right questions. So for example, if there's a couple of green circles on next to the pathway, I will ask um, what, what kind of species is it? What kind of, what will that tree grow into? What would it look like in five years time? Will it start to obscure that pathway or will it create a place of concealment for somebody hiding behind there um, and make it intimidating for somebody walking through there? Um, Later on, so it's all about establishing the context. I might ask if it's a park, are you planning on illuminating the site at night? If, if so, which pathway? Because it doesn't make sense to illuminate every pathway because it, street lighting is one of local government and, and governments in general's greatest expenses. So, and we've got to be energy efficient. We've got to support reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. We've got to support the sustainable cities agenda. I would ask, you know, have you looked at which pedestrian route is, is intended to be used the most? If so, then you might then put lighting along that route and along that route only. Of course, lighting is no longer about turning lights on and off. Now we have 
sensor-based lighting, so so-called smart lighting. So again, that might be an, an intervention too. But essentially what we're about is asking the right questions to establish what the context is. And some of those questions that you ask, you're actually educating these planners and architects because they haven't thought about these considerations before, right? So like I said, I'm not a horticulturist. So when I see landscaping on a map, whether it's in a park or along a street or something, I have to ask what it is and what it will look like and what it will become. You know, they're the kind of questions that then get those experts from other fields thinking, oh yeah, I hadn't actually thought about that. What, what will happen in five years' time? It could become a place of concealment. Someone could hide there. Someone could ambush somebody walking past. Um, people could avoid the area because it's it's all become overgrown now. You know? uh, it doesn't have an owner. Does, it's not very well maintained. So that's kind of like a simple example of something where you work in September because it is very much a, a collaborative process and you learn about the context and the intended use of spaces by working together. Is it safe to say that the ideal time to start thinking about septed is at the early stages of design? Yeah, definitely. I mean, septed is a process that can apply at the micro level. So you can look at an individual building. I've worked on a lot of mixed use developments and they have their own unique crime and safety considerations. It's important to recognise that different crimes happen in different situations, in different settings. So with septet training, you can actually say, oh, you've got a new apartment building going in here. Okay. Oh, what's this, this louvered fixture that runs up the top of the building? Because somebody could step onto the facade and actually climb up onto people's balconies from there. People follow cars into basement car parks and break into cars and storage cages, for example. So they're the, they're the kind of things that can happen in the so-called micro environment in terms of crime but then you can also look at septet from a master planning perspective and look at how people actually get to the site i was, I was working on a master plan out in southwest sydney for a, a, a brand new community and it was just a series of paddocks and one of the paddocks was being master planned into a, a neighborhood residential development and one of the findings from from that master plan process was that to actually to get to that community once it was finished, you had to walk through quite a narrow, dark underpass. So you can look at the big drawing of the concept for a master plan, but it's very easy to think, well, how, how do you actually get to that place in the first place? In this instance, it was, a, it was quite a dodgy sort of dangerous underpass so people didn't access this part of the community on foot at night. So that's the kind of thing you can head off. You can also think about things like, you know, it's, it can be feel unsafe to wait at a bus stop on your own at night, for example. So if you're taking that sort of bird's eye, bird's eye view of a concept for a master plan, you can actually position a bus stop in a place where there's some sort of activity, buildings overlooking the bus stop, where maybe there's, there's some shops there as well. There's, there's people moving about that space, it actually improves your perceptions if you're waiting by yourself at that bus stop. So there's, there's things that we can do at the micro level right through to that sort of macro master planning stage. John, I wanted to ask, what are common design flaws that you see in the planning and design of buildings and places? Well, sometimes people don't have training in septet. Septet's sometimes perceived as being just another layer of bureaucracy or red tape that's going to, you know, stall, get that development getting approved. Um, but as I say to people, you know, you might say that looking at crime is a, is a kind of narrow lens because you're looking at something that might happen. You know? But we do the same with sprinkler systems and, and fire alarm and smoke detectors. We have things in place to prevent things happening um, later on, and crime is just another one of those considerations. So firstly, there can be a reluctance on the part of the development community to, to put a crime prevention report together to support how to actually demonstrate how their development um, prevents crime. And often these reports are actually written by the developers themselves. And there's been some research done on this at Sydney University through Garner Clancy and his colleagues. So that what happens is some of these septet reports aren't really worth the paper they're written on because they're written by somebody who doesn't have an understanding of septet. They'll list the four principles. 
this is our septed report and these are the four principles and you know you, you, if i'm looking at that I, I know what they are you don't need to explain it to me. they're kind of looking for something to put into the report right septed reports rarely refer to specific crime so if you're putting a mixed-use development in for some new apartments which is as i said it's fairly common in our cities because we're living in more densely we need to live in, in higher concentrations uh, we need to reduce sprawl get on the public transport and do all those other important dimensions to city making but we've also got to actually think about what specific crimes are you trying to prevent so that in, in an apartment dwelling as i said you're going to be looking at things like people breaking into the basement into storage cages into cars they're going to try and break into one of these properties and steal things so pretty common obvious that they're the kind of crimes that are going to happen in that setting but a septic report from a developer often doesn't refer to any specific crimes it will just refer to crime generally right so in the end a lot of the reports don't actually demonstrate how that development prevents specific crimes in that setting you just get this sort of broad wishy-washy report which could apply to any apartment setting anywhere and there, there have actually been some examples of reports that have been cut and pasted and used from one setting to another. So we need to um, call these things out. And um, as I said, improve expertise and ex education around SEPTED so that we, uh, we can improve the quality of those reports so that um, we can actually see specific crimes have been assessed, analysed, and actually the design of the building has altered to some extent to accommodate those specific crimes. In New South Wales, is, it's a requirement to include in your uh, development application an, an assessment for SEPTED, correct? For certain types of developments. Yes. Do local councils know as well how to, like, are they equipped to read these reports and assess, okay, this is sufficient or this doesn't really do the job, it's not fit for purpose for this development or for this local government area. It's, it's a really hard one because yeah, if, if you're working for the council and you're reading the substandard report that might look very similar to the report you read a couple of weeks ago for another development on a, in a different part of the city, you can call it out, tell the planner that, look, it's, it's a substandard report, it doesn't really uh, look at SEPTED the way that it should, but it's not reason enough to actually not not approve a development you can't sort of say well you know, they haven't really looked at crime prevention so therefore you can't approve the development because we don't want to be seen to be a stumbling block in the process either that we want to, you know because investment in our cities is, is really important we need more housing we need more apartment blocks so you don't want to lose sight of, of the bigger picture of, of density and how important it is for cities. But what I would normally do, rather, I used to just say, oh, it's the, the report's just a lot of practice. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have enough information to make a comment. Then I, I then realised that wasn't really an effective way of dealing with it. It's better if I just come back to them with questions and say, oh, can you tell me, are there measures in place to look at security in the basement car park? Uh, would you be having storage cages? If so, what sort of locks would you be applying to those cages? Have you thought about people following cars into the basement and what security measures you might put in place with that in mind? So just send those sorts of issues back to the planner too, who then deals directly with the applicant. Uh, and hopefully they can then make those adjustments based on your questions, which I said earlier can often educate them the person as well so you're not necessarily dealing with ignorance you're dealing with people who don't understand or have the knowledge to to supply that information so by asking the questions and, and going through the planner to return those lines of inquiry to the applicant they can then as i said hopefully make some adjustments and adaptations to what's originally proposed based on your comments and, and questions how would you measure or assess if accepted strategy was successful? Yeah, it's a really good question because we're very good, for example, at planning and designing and um, talking to people and you know, looking at crime data and the evidence and, and putting a, a, a project in place in a public area, for example. You know, and often at the end of that project, the outcome looks great, people are in the site, you know, and so on. 
but we don't evaluate the space. We don't actually evaluate the project. We move on to the next project. Right? So where we do make mistakes, um, we find out later on because evaluation isn't part of the planning process. Um, so that's that's a real and often if SEPTED hasn't been considered at the beginning of the development application or the project planning process, then you end up with these negative consequences. Um, but good consequences if you if you're a criminal, you know, you actually are. Oh, this is good, you know, because now you've actually created opportunities for for offenders, or you've actually produced poor planning outcomes, like a really common um, poor outcome is giving uh, a building a fortified look. So getting lots of iron bars, entries that look like prison cells, for example. So these things affect our perceptions. You think, well, you know, if I live here, this isn't a very nice image of my, of my community. You know? There's these bars everywhere on the doors and the windows and stairwells and so forth. Another really common crime is mailbox theft. So we end up with something simple like mailboxes being out on the street as you look along the footpath. And the mailbox is often made of flimsy material. It's something that builders and developers don't spend a lot of money on. And the key that they give you if you're a resident in that apartment block will likely not only open every other letterbox in that block, but you might be able to go to another part of the city and use the same key or open all the letterboxes in those areas as well. So, and so what happens is that um, people steal your mail they're employed by organised crime syndicates to walk along densely populated areas where there's a large banks of letterboxes out on the footpath. They'll fill these sacks with, with mail and the idea is they're trying to get, you know, your gas bill, your driver's licence, your phone bill, whatever it is, um, bank statement, rates notice from your council. And each of those documents is worth so many points if you want to um, assume somebody else's identity. This is... This is the, the long game. They try and sometimes they return to the same address to try and get more ID because they've got you know so many points. You get, you get 100 points of identity. Um, you can then assume, take that person's identity. This is known as identity fraud. Um, and the first thing you know about it is when the bank contacts you and says you haven't been making your repayments on your half million dollar loan which of course you don't know anything about. So something as simple as positioning letterboxes inside a secure entry is a really good crime prevention measure, but it's not something that's considered because it's seen as a, a small incidental um, level of detail that's not, not really worthy of consideration. You actually just scared me there, John. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to be careful in crime prevention because you can... You, if you're not, if you don't know the people you're talking to very well, you might well be giving them some good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, with all these changes with technology, of course, the approach is also changing in your line of work. How has technology, well, one, improved the way you do septed, and how has it made it more difficult for you? Yeah, well, I'll take a, like a really simple example, like home burglary in your neighbourhood quarter acre house on a dwelling. So burglary is an offence that is less common than it used to be. And one of the reasons for that is because all of our household items are not as valuable as they used to be. So people used to break into a house knowing full well that they could steal televisions, video recorders, um, maybe a, a camera, um, or even, you know, I mean, I got my record collection stolen, for example. My CDs were stolen. It's a blow I've, I've really struggled to recover from just quietly. Uh, but you know what I'm saying is that they're, they're, very, they're very incidental items. Um, but back in the day, they had some value. And any offender could know that any house would have all of those things, right? So there'd always be something that was worth stealing. Now, in today's day and age, uh, firstly, we live in a cashless society. So that notion of people hiding lots of money under the mattress that's sort of disappeared. So technology has really helped us in terms of um, using our cards instead of um, having to go to the ATM at night, for example, which, which might not be a, a safe thing to do, um, then we can use our cards. But, but crime evolves and criminal activity evolves with it. So 
if you're going to break into a house now, maybe you'll get some jewellery or some small, valuable, portable items, but you're never really sure what you're going to get. So on one level, that reduces that motivation to actually for that type of crime. But an offender might then think, well, cycling is much more common now, right? We're building more separated cycleways. It's part of our active transport strategy as part of the evolution of cities. Get people moving, get them healthier, get them to use public transport as well and so forth. So the bicycle is now a, an item that's that's of interest. And of course, you know, some of these high-end bicycles are worth thousands of dollars and they're often just stored in the shed out the back of the, out the house, right? Or, or they're on the front veranda or on the deck of the house or something. So that a person walking by can actually see, oh, that's actually a nice bike, you know, I can, I can sell that second hand. So things like bicycles have become more valuable and also more common. And that might be the motivation for an offender in a domestic dwelling to go to the shed or go around the side of the house or something looking for a high-end bicycle rather than the old style of way of doing things, which would be to sort of try and get in the side or the back window, the side window or the back door or something. So that's kind of a way that technology has evolved in and in, in the way that criminals and the way they work has evolved as well. You've mentioned considerations for certain development types like homes, apartment buildings, parks as well. I understand that you're doing some work currently with Sydney Metro. What considerations do you have when planning for public transport or areas with very high pedestrian traffic? Uh, well, for example, you know, with the light rail stops, you know, the each of those stops, I mean, I got asked to comment on some light rail stops for the Parramatta Metro. And I was given one diagram to comment on, one diagram. And I said to the person I was working with, which station is this one? She said, that's all the stations. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, that's what they've given me to go. On. This is another example of where SEPTED's kind of been trying to, it's been seen as something that gets in the way of Okay, we'll do a septet report, but uh, they do it reluctantly, right? So obviously, when you're looking at nine stations, you're going to have nine completely different settings, and each of those nine settings will have their own unique characteristics about them, right? Some of them will relate to the land uses around that that particular um, stop, for example. There may be a school there, so you're going to have lots of school children not only using that light rail, but also. Um, providing the eyes on the street, the surveillance, that activity, that vitality in that area so that if you're waiting at that stop, um, that school is going to hopefully make you feel a bit safer uh, because there's, there's this presence of other people. You might have shops um, and other, you know, supermarkets and things like that, um, the dentist, the doctor, services like that, um, the library, whatever it is. You want to try and have those, your stops, in and around these areas of activity where possible. So it's all about context, isn't it? So one stop can be in a quiet, deserted area where there's no one around, there's no, because you can't necessarily have activity everywhere. You know, that, that's also not necessarily a realistic prospect. And the late night economy is often talked about that when we talk about the 24 hour city, where we're not really a 24 hour city. We might be on Friday and Saturday nights, but we're certainly not a 24 hour city in Sydney on Tuesday night, for example. Um, so it's all about context and making sure that uh, you have these sort of considerations around who's in the area, who's going to be using these sites uh, at what times of the day, on what days. Uh, what's the difference between night and day? Because this is another really important set of consideration when you look at project plans and so forth. You very rarely see photo montages or images at night. You know, when people promote their new developments. They're always daytime settings, right? So um, just a really simple set of question is, what will this space look like at night? Who's going to be using it? What's the intended use of the space at night? How is it different to the daytime intended use? Because that's another factor that's, that's very rarely considered. So all of these things you would think about in terms of improving the public transport in our city.
It's interesting you mentioned that. I've worked closely with architects and designers on master plans and have made the same comment about how we need to also consider how people will use spaces at different times of the day and different weather conditions. Perspectives more often than not only illustrate a sunny day in proposed developments. Exactly. I mean, something like I was in Brisbane a couple of years ago and I, I was catching the bus. Uh, it was like 37 degrees, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it was really, really hot. And the, the bus stop was facing right directly into the sun. So you couldn't actually sit at the bus stop to wait for the bus, right? Because one of the important things when we think about set head is, when, is we've got to also consider comfort and amenity. These things also go with safety and our perceptions of fear. If we don't feel comfortable in a space, then we're not going to use the space. So again, if once the space doesn't get used, you can create that sense that no one's about. So therefore, it's easy to commit a crime because the last thing a criminal wants is to be witnessed in the course of committing their act. Because once there's a witness, that's often the first step then toward them being um, apprehended and arrested and go to court or sentenced or not and so forth. So something as simple as somebody seeing somebody, somebody doing the wrong thing by somebody who just happens to be there is really, really important in that sense because that can actually prevent a whole series of, of, of far worse things happening. So comfort is really important. So again, if it's something like a bus stop, you know, you've got to think about providing shade. You might provide somewhere to charge your phone while, while you're at the bus stop. You might provide some landscaping that cools at the angle of the roof focus a certain way so that the light is projected away from the stop. You may consider relocating some stops into more comfortable uh, environments because our cities are getting really, really hot. And you get out to places in Western Sydney in, in, in January, waiting at that bus stop can be a really uncomfortable experience. And of course, the last thing we want is for people to get into their cars and drive instead of getting on the bus. And then obviously that may contribute to congestion and air pollution and, all, and poor air quality and all these other things that um, affect our quality of life. But also not everybody has an option to get in the car. We've got to consider that as well. So like the comfort of, of places, somewhere we can have a drink next to somebody you have to wait for it's hot. Um, and it's not uncommon to sometimes see a bus stop in the sunshine and a whole lot, bunch of people standing under the shade nearby to wait for the bus. So, you know, again, the comfort of the person waiting, and this is really important, the waiting experience is really important in the whole public transport sort of um, area, if you like. You know, any way that we can improve the waiting experience and get more people on the public transport is really important. You wrote a series of articles on LinkedIn about delivering better spaces for women and girls. So there are a range of things we can do to address that. But do you, what are urgent um, things or easy um, steps that we can do to consider women and girls more in their safety in public spaces? Well, the first thing, and the, by far the most critical thing, is to talk to women and girls. Right? We don't need a bunch of middle-aged male bureaucrats sitting in offices saying, let's put more lighting and CCTV into places because that's a good strategy which will make everybody feel safe, including women and girls, right? Now, that may be the solution, but that's often a simplistic idea that governments uh, commonly pursue because it's seen to be a bit of a quick fix. They're only part of a short-term political cycle. And they want to be seen to be doing something. Now, if you're going to actually organise a consultation with women and girls who use a space, well, that takes resources. You've got to actually have someone whose job is to actually get out there on the spot, talk to women and girls at night and in the day and in the night uh, where you have concerns about safety in a specific site because, as I said, every site is unique. Every site has its own unique characteristics. Every site will have different user groups of different ages, different genders, at different times of the day and night. So the first thing to do is where you have an incident um, and there may be some information which there is the risk, then the first thing to do is to understand the space, get into that space, talk to the users of that space. Then you might actually be better informed around what you should do there. We 
which may include lighting, which may include CCTV, uh, but it may include different measures as well. You might, for example, in an area where, which is quite, you might um, have a busking program where you could just put street musicians into places that are a little bit dead, but there's a lot of activity going on around it. So you want to integrate that dead spot better with what's going on around that space and include that space, if you like, with that broader area. So then you might set up some level of activity um, which will get people moving through that space. Because we also have to consider when we're talking about surveillance, we need to look beyond the visual environment. We have to look at the sensory environment too. So if you hear somebody scream, or you smell gas leaking or something. Well, these are other potential safety considerations that uh, we don't necessarily see. So sometimes the, the visibility factor can sort of dominate all of our other sensory experiences in public spaces. And so it's really important to consider all of those things as well. So if you can improve the acoustic environment, for example, in a space, and people can hear the music in it and they then become attracted to what might otherwise have been a dead space. Well, that's an acoustic solution rather than something that might be more visibility or surveillance related like lighting or CCTV. But yeah, the important thing in terms of gender equity is to include women and girls directly in discussions around what needs to be done. Because it's a process that's often overlooked. Women and girls navigate the city differently to men. The surveillance effect at night, for example, is an interesting one because we say that uh, uh, we want to have eyes on the street, we want to have people out and about creating that vitality, creating that sense that there are potential witnesses to anything that might happen. Uh, but we also observe one another in terms of making sure we don't bump into each other. Right? We, have to, we have to be aware of other people around us. But nevertheless, generally the presence of other people gives us some sense of reassurance. Now that can be completely different at night where it's quite late in the night. There are a lot of intoxicated or drug affected people about. People who are marginalized or on the edge can become more visible because they often sleep during the day. And there's also evidence that nightlife is very masculinized. It's a homosocial environment. So you tend to have more men dominating private and public spaces than there are women. Uh, so if you're a woman with another woman or on your own, the notion of walking past a group of men standing on the footpath who may be intoxicated, that notion of surveillance and reassurance of others isn't necessarily there. Right? You might actually cross the road in that instance and I've got to avoid the potential for harassment or or drawing attention to myself or whatever it is. Um, and they may then take a route that they might not ordinarily have taken, like down a, a dark lane or somewhere, you know. And often when there are offences that happen, women can be unfairly blamed later on after the, after the tragic incident. And people might say, well, why did she walk that way in the first place? Which is really not a very nice way of looking at this notion that cities are made for all of us. You know, we don't create spaces and, sp and places for some people in the community. We create them for everybody. And this is a really important part of what SEPTED's all about. It, it's a very inclusive um, concept. So as I said, we're going to make it a community safer. We're going to make it more inclusive as well. Um, so we've got to be careful of blaming the victim for their, because everybody has a right to the city. Well, Sydney is relatively a, a safe city, but of course, you know, there are still some spots that uh, aren't as safe as, as they should be. In your studies, though, what do you are cities, whether in Australia or in other parts of the world, that are doing it right in terms of considering women and girls uh, in public spaces? Well, there is some evidence coming out of Norway that the gap between feeling, feeling safe or unsafe, um, uh, uh, actually the gap is narrow. But we look at a lot of the evidence will say that that gap isn't, isn't um, drawing together at, at all. So in Norway, they are, uh, and Norway is interesting because they don't have a lot of closed circuit TV in Norway. That these socialist governments are pretty kind of anti CCTV because they see it as a social problem and people commit crime, so therefore people should prevent crime. Why that's effective in that way, it's very difficult to tell. It's maybe it's a part of the national psyche. It, you know, it's, it's hard to know 
why some places are safer than others in the sense that human beings are unpredictable people. And planning and design won't necessarily influence the motivations of a criminal. If a criminal wants to break down a door, it doesn't matter how many locks you put on it or how what it's made of or whatever, they just go and get a small explosive and blow it up and get through the door. Like this, if you're determined enough to get through the door, then there are limitations to the, um, the planning and design process. I mean, crimes of passion, for example, that link to ex, ex partners and the terrible things that go on uh, that can happen. Uh, between a man and a woman who used to be together. I mean, a lot of those sort of homicides are, are related to, you know, this, this level of domestic violence and domestic homicide. That's not something that the planning and design process can necessarily influence, you know, that's something happening outside of that. Um, but I will say more broadly, safer places are very much dependent on good standards of governance, strong institutions, and the, the rule of law, good quality management and maintenance of public spaces, all of these things underpin us feeling safe more than anything else. And if, I think if you have those things in place, that will reflect more broadly on, on how safe people feel in, in public and private spaces. John, you're in the process of publishing a book. Can you tell us more about it, please? Yeah, well, Septed, what I love about Septed is it, 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 it illustrates really well. You know, I'm married to a drama teacher and her philosophy is always show it, don't say it. I don't need to shove text down people's throats. Look at it, observe it. You can see what the image is to the extent that you can in terms of you don't have all the context, of course, with one photo, but it's a discussion point. So... My Septet courses are very image-based and we look at a whole series of situations in public and private spaces, demonstrating the kind of um, good and bad design and looking at um, Septet in specific settings where people most commonly feel unsafe is what the book's about. So there's chapters on the urban structure, how you actually lay the streets out to begin with, what sort of land uses you put in there, how you sort of promote that walking environment, how you promote building, observing public areas, preferably having it on some level of a human scale. The other chapters in the book look at integrated transport, walking and cycling, business and the economy, shops and retail, uh, look at public toilets, uh, public lighting, of course, is a, is a huge issue in terms of safety and crime prevention. Um, yeah, so it's 10 chapters. It's, I'm on the last chapter now. Um, so that's why I'm kind of, sort of talking about public toilets because that's the chapter I'm writing. And it's an interesting subject because, it, you know, as I said, we're, we're very good at designing really great public spaces. And if we were actually to think about what are the things in a public space that demonstrate that it's a safe place. It's, it's, it's very easy to describe an unsafe place and say, well, it's, it's dark and it's deserted and it looks neglected and, you know, it looks spooky or whatever. But if you ask the person to describe what a safe place looks like, um, there are actually cues that people give off. You know, they might take their shoes off. They might recline on a, on a street, on a bench. They might put, put their bare feet in the fountain. Um, lovers in the public square feel relaxed enough to be intimate in a public place. So it's often said that, you know, a safe place uh, is treated like your lounge room, the so-called third space. So if you have these kind of behaviours, they actually exhibit that the space is working really well. But, it, but eventually, everybody in that space, no matter how much we want to encourage them to linger for longer, which is one of the again, one of the um, ideas behind a successful public space is they have to use a toilet, right? they have to use a toilet. And most of us have been in that situation where you need to go, you don't know where you are, the city's not familiar to you, and so you go off on this tangent. So that's just an example in the book around how important public amenities are in, in supporting crime prevention. It's been a, a labour of love. I've been writing this now for about four years. Uh, it is very picture-heavy. Um, and hopefully it illustrates all of these situations that we find ourselves in the public and private spaces in our cities and how those spaces are exploited by criminals and the kind of things we can consider to um, make it harder for those things to happen and 
make a criminal maybe consider going elsewhere to commit their crime. I studied urban design in the UK and until now I use the book of my professors called Responsive Environments. Have you heard about it? No, I haven't. No. It's very it good. Up, yeah, it, it's quite old. I think they wrote it in the 80s or something like that. Yeah. And it's very picture heavy. And yes. you know, you can it um you can relate to it whether yeah. you're you know in England or any part of the world. I, I highly recommend that you look at it. Um as you prepare for your book. Yeah, okay. and it's interesting you, you say that, but even though these things may have been published in the 80s, the issues don't change, right? They're exactly. Still, we're still dealing with people, we're still dealing with environments, and we're just still dealing with the unique characteristics of those environments. So responsive environments is, is really important. And as I say, that's why those books often are timeless, because that picture tells a, a thousand words, doesn't it? It really does. And with the principles you mentioned and considerations as well, you know, it, well, as you said as well, it's really going back to good design. And it's funny how, you know, accepted or new urbanism, a lot of them are going back to how we used to design places in the earlier um, times when, you know, there was more engagement with the street and encouraging neighbors to actually talk to each other less yeah, gates I mean, that, no that, gates <laughs> yeah i mean that's something i didn't talk about as neighbors and how important they are and that you know it's often said that crime prevention is like charity it begins at home you know if you say hello to people who walk up and down your streets whether you know them or not then that increases the conspicuousness of somebody in that area who maybe doesn't have the right intentions and it's probably interesting all the more now with um you know um social distancing yes Is it yeah altering the sense of neighborliness that's right yeah i mean for example in apartment living a lot of people when i've done focus groups you'll ask them well do you know your neighbors they kind of look at you and what do you mean no i you know i work five days a week and i'm out and about on the weekend and uh, and it's the question can sometimes really throw people but you know, if someone's delivering you a pizza or a parcel or your next door neighbor's on fire or, you know, something like that, it's actually, you or there's, you know, there's an intru- there's somebody in the basement car park who you're not sure should be there. Um, knowing your neighbours is, is really important. You don't have to, I mean, neighbours are a bit like family. You don't get to choose who they are, do you? Uh, so you don't have to be friendly necessarily, but you to actually just know each other and know that, who belongs where is really important, particularly in, as our environments become more dense. And it's much easier for a stranger to sort of get into these sort of communal spaces in apartment living environments and blend in. And, you know, as I say, if they're up to the wrong thing, unless you know they're not meant to be there, then they kind of have a license to keep coming back. Someone was interested to uh, attend your training courses or learn more about the work that you do. What's the best way to do that? Uh, the best way to be, be go to the local government New South Wales website, LG New South Wales, and they run a whole series of courses for council workers and the private sector. They're open to everybody. They're just the provider of that. So I'm currently running three-day courses in SEPTED. Um, the first day focuses on the background to the course, to, to criminology more general and crime prevention more generally, and we look at those four principles of SEPTED. Uh, and then the second day, we look at those septet principles in these specific locations, which also more or less reflect the locations um, in the book, you know, like public toilets and parks and streetscapes and um, integrated transport environments and, and so on, apartment living, uh, the kind of crimes that happen in those settings. And in the third day, people break up into groups and they'll go out to a national site and they work together on putting a set ten assessment together. So quite an interesting exercise because, um, you know, safety is very much about the look and the feel. Again, when you're looking at plans and diagrams and being asked to comment on places, unless you've actually been to the site, you have a very different experience when you're in the office or at home commenting on that kind of thing. So I can't sort of emphasise enough how important it is to get out into the field, spend time in the field, observing people's behaviour in the field, talking to site users in that space, which is what these groups do uh, on, on 
their site assessments. So, for example, you know, we had a, a landscape architect do the course who was upgrading the park with a new children's playground. They went out to the park as part of their site assessment. And there really were, there weren't that many people in the park. It was like 11 o'clock on Thursday morning. And it was a lovely day. I got talking to a couple of the users in the park. He said, oh, do you come here often? And the, the people was telling him, no, I don't come here very often. I would like to, but I can't. But I can't get any parking in this area. It's an area where, Campbelltown area, where people have to drive their cars, more or less. Uh, I would like to come here more often, but I can't because I have to drive my car. And then when I get here, I can't get a park. And so they were building a new hospital next to this park, right? And all the hospital workers were taking up all the parking around the park. So here he was with this budget to create this wonderful new playground. He talked to all the people in the council about it, you know, with various disciplines. Um, there's part of the collaborative process. You know, they've done a committee consultation. But a couple of conversations with people in the park made him realise we have to sort the parking situation out before we think about having a wonderful playground that nobody can get to. So just a subtle point that was picked up on a set TED site assessment. Um, and again, showing the value of actually spending time in, in, in space and talking to people who use that space and how that can really um, produce much better outcomes in terms of, uh, in this case, a, a public park. I will sign up for that class, John. I think it's, it's very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> so I'll, I'll see you. Up. Yeah, you have. I'll see you in class soon. I've enjoyed so much our discussion and I learned so much, John. Is there anything, of course, you've, you shared so much, but if there was one key takeaway that you would like the people listening to to go away with, what would that be? It would be that every, every site's unique. Every site has its own unique characteristics. And as I said, spending time in the space, talking to people, looking at crime data, looking at any other reports or uh, evidence that you can use to better understand that space, how people behave in that space, whether that's it appropriately or not. Um, and then, as I say, going, going away and asking the right questions for that specific space. It's if you ask the right questions, can I see and be seen in this, in this space? Is there anything that is going to block the sight line and make me feel like I'm about to be ambushed? Are there places where people can hide? Uh, will it be lit at night? Why will it be lit at night? Who will use the site at night? These kind of questions which develop context in specific areas, that allows you to understand and establish context. Once you have that, you can then be in a better place and feel more confident about providing set advice. But you cannot do that unless you understand the context. So um, that would be my takeaway message. Every space is unique and make an effort to understand it. And you can not only produce safer places, but you'll produce better places as well. And that's ultimately what we're all aiming to do. Thank you so much, John. Thanks, Carmen. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Beyond Places. I would love to hear from you. Feel free to connect with me on social media and carmipalafox at gmail.com. If you enjoy this podcast, please do subscribe. Bye and see you again in the next episode.